Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to uh, the last great day of Velocity. All right, up and running. Um, so my talk today, we're going to start um, start by looking at what happens when you start with a simple idea. And through that, I'm going to take, take you on a deep dive into how Facebook has, challenged, has tackled the challenge of scaling our infrastructure, how our engineering culture helped us overcome some of these challenges, and even how you can use openness uh, in your own business if you're not already, and I know many of you are, to accelerate the adoption of technology. Nope, oh, this is not working. Man, throw off my mojo on the first slide. All right, no remote, I'm gonna stand here and press the button. So before we get into that, I'm gonna take you guys back in time a little bit to 2007. So when I joined Facebook, we had 40 million users and we thought that was just insane and totally crazy. And it absolutely was. Growth was accelerating, we were fighting every day for users and uh, I walked in and I had to fight every day just to keep the site up and, uh, and, and keep serving users and, and keep our users happy. But the interesting thing that happened over the next four years or so is that in addition to growth accelerating, the pace of innovation in our business also accelerated. And this is kind of interesting because it's the inverse of what normally happens, right? Normally as businesses grow, the pace of innovation slows down. You get to be more conservative and risk averse and, and you bet less of the company every day. And one of the things I think that's actually very special about Facebook is how we continue to bet and take big bets on technology and on products. And that's really meant our infrastructure has had to work really hard to keep up and support all that innovation. And when I started at Facebook, I had brown hair, and as you can see, it's not very brown anymore. So we also had humble beginnings, like many other people in this room. When Mark started Facebook, it was started on a shared hosting account that cost him $85 a month. We've grown a little bit since then, and I'll walk you through a quick progression of that growth. The first phase of our growth was we moved to a colo environment. And we had a pretty simple web server connecting to a, a back-end database, a MySQL server. And one of the first things that our engineer real, engineers realized is that a site like Facebook would never work without just badass caching. A guy named Jeff Rothschild was leading the engineering team at the time and inserted something called Memcached, which we've all known and, and all come to know and love today, and in some cases hate because we depend on it so heavily. And we ran with this architecture for a couple of years and, and ran really well with this architecture. But as it scaled and we continue to scale uh, out of a single colo site to multiple sites and into thousands of servers, managing this just one big collection of hosts was just increasingly difficult. So we did the next logical thing. We broke hosts down into clusters. And I'll walk you through kind of what these clusters are in, uh, for a few seconds. So first you see we still have the web and memcache. That's where the, mo the core of the Facebook application exists. And we added in uh, some other applications that are very closely tied to serving every page on Facebook. Ads, we all need them. Multi-feed, which is our, our feed system which powers the home page on Facebook. It uh, does a variety of other things. And a whole bunch of other small services, such as people you may know, friend suggester, et cetera. Then we added a, a service cluster over time. And the purpose of the service cluster was really to host other large services. So two examples of some of these large services are Hadoop for data analysis. We've talked a lot about this in, in other talks. Uh, have tens of petabytes of Hadoop, as well as our, our messages platform. If you use Facebook today, uh, you're, you're now using an integrated messaging experience that combines uh, what we have known, to, what we know as email, uh, messages on Facebook, and, and chat. And our backend clusters still remain largely the same. They're MySQL instances. We have upwards of 10,000 of those instances, physical instances today. Uh, containing all our user data, photo storage, video storage, and so forth. And of course, um, you know, there's, there's some numbers here of, of sort of how some of these things have scaled. Ultimately, the size of the cluster is a function of the number of 10 gig ports on a, on a core switch. And today, that's one of our limiting factors, and it's probably a challenge we're going to take on uh, here in the, in the coming months is figuring out how we can run even larger and larger clusters. But of course, all of these servers have to live somewhere and as Facebook grew, we, as I mentioned, we switched from a, a hosted account to a co-location business uh, and started leasing data center space all around the US. But for two years, we continued to blow through our capacity plans. Mark kept coming to me and challenging me to do more, do more, do better, do better. And I kept telling him I just didn't believe that we could continue growing, and I was wrong. As a result, I got really bad performance reviews, and uh, 
the site ran slow and the site broke a lot because it turns out when you run something at 120%, it slows down, it breaks a lot, and that really hurts users. And so we thought it was time to change our approach and do two things differently. Well, a whole lot of things differently, but I'm just gonna talk about two of them. The first was that uh, we decided to really focus on efficiency, and the second was have a much, much bigger hammer to how we grow capacity. So the first bit on, on efficiency is we, we started looking at software, right? It's the, the biggest part of our infrastructure, and quite frankly, there's just no substitute for bad code anywhere, and, and arguably no excuse for bad code. And in the pursuit of our, in, in this pursuit for maximum efficiency, we only had a couple hundred people that we could apply to this, but we had literally hundreds of efficiency projects we could tackle. And I'm just gonna walk you through an example of one project and, and how we got through it. And the project is replacing our PHP runtime. For us, PHP was a, was a big, big problem. Our application is, is written in PHP. PHP consumes a lot of CPU and a lot of memory. So as such, we took multiple parallel paths to hopefully get to the right outcome, or a, Dar a Darwinian approach to innovation. And so we had three engineers working on three different approaches. The first was Ben, who worked on the PHP server, which was essentially rewriting some of the elements of Zend. Kind of low risk, low reward in terms of the performance gain we thought we could get from it. Steve then took on Quirkus, which was a PHP to Java compiler. Kind of medium risk, medium reward. Would allow us to run, continue running an interpreted environment, maybe easier to code, definitely easier to have introspection in, in servers. And the last approach was taken on by Haiping. Haiping took the approach of writing a brand new runtime or a source code transformer. HPHP, or what's known in the, in the community as hip hop for PHP, transforms PHP code into C++ code, C++ code, and then uses G++ to compile all that code. It also allows us to reuse business logic between people writing code in C, C++, Python, and Java. So as I said, we had these three projects all running in parallel, all sort of uh, developing at different, different paces. The first one that we sort of dimmed the lights on, if you will, was PHP server. It was low risk, low reward. Ben made a lot of headway early on, and for a short period of time, we ran the site on his code. But the performance gains just weren't significant. The next project we dimmed the lights on was, was Steve's Quirkus project. And the, the challenge here was that although it, allowed, it was operationally easy to run, we really wanted to focus on maximum performance and maximum efficiency. And as such, we shut down that project, Darwin took over, and HPHP went out for the day. To date, uh, dozens of sites have adopted HPHP or hip hop for PHP, and in conjunction with the community, we've made our base interpreter from when we, when we left the, running the base interpreter in 2009 to today six times more efficient. Just when it took over, it was 50% more efficient. And let me tell you, that was an awesome, awesome day because we were once again out of capacity the day we turned on HPHP. So that was just, it was a major relief for me and it was awesome. So as, as you recall, we launched HPHP in early 2009 and we were literally at a breaking point with our physical infrastructure. And we, we took a lot of time thinking about how software worked with the servers and how servers could work in the data center. And as I said, we reached a decision point. We either had to continue doing what we were doing or do something radically different. And we spent a lot of time thinking about what radical was and how exactly radical we could be. And we spent a lot of time controlling OEMs to build custom things for us, integ integrate systems in different ways, talking to landlords and asking them to build us data centers of different shapes, sizes, uh, getting creative with lease terms, et cetera. Unfortunately, we, didn't, we couldn't find any open platforms we could leverage, and the OEMs and the data center landlords weren't as flexible as we really wanted to be. So we decided to start from scratch. We gave our engineers a challenge, which was start with a clean slate and design the most efficient compute for the best economics possible. And we decided to think about everything from the power grid all the way down to the gate on the, mother, on the, uh, on the CPU. So thinking about power grid to gate. The other challenge we had is that we were always playing catch up. We thought about our product in six month cycles, but as we grew and grew, our infrastructure planning went from sort of a week long, month long horizon to, oh my goodness, you wanna stand up a data center? Well, that takes two years. It's really hard to align a two year project plus call it a year for approvals and getting yourself all lined up if your product changes every month. And 
since there wasn't really any history, you couldn't run any, any sort of quantitative analysis on this. This was all intuitive judgment and planning, or trying to plan, I should say. <laughs> but of course, we weren't the first company to build our own servers or build our own data centers. But really, those in innovations from, from others emboldened us to take the path of both building our own servers and designing our own data centers and thinking about how software works with the servers it runs on and how those servers work in the building. We definitely had the advantage of starting later and being able to learn from all the wisdom and mistakes of those who came before us. But at the same time, people were visiting me, people came to visit Mark when I said no, and they told us we were crazy. They're like, Jonathan, this is, this is horrible. Why would you want to build a server? Why would you want to build a data center? It's hundreds of people, millions of man hours of work. Let us do it for you. We promise we'll do it, even though you've been conjoling us for months and we haven't done it. We promise we'll do it now that you've actually threatened to go do it yourself. We said no thanks. We thought about their motivations. So we went down this path of building our own hardware. Unfortunately, Facebook was a software company, not a hardware company. We had a, only a few people. We didn't have any lab space. We didn't have any equipment. We didn't even have any supplier relationships. So arguably, we didn't even know where to start. And as such, we just took a less is more philosophy. We said, let's be simple, and let's focus on what really matters with the servers. And to start, we had to find a lab. And so I went around and was asking our facilities, guys, we've got this wonderful Palo Alto campus. Guys, where are we going to put our lab? We've got three engineers that started this program. They were Amir, Pierre, and Sandy. I need, a, I need to find a home for these three engineers. And the best we could come up with was our shipping and receiving area, where we stored all the fa those wonderful Facebook t-shirts. And that became our lab space. Out of this dinky lab, we produced some pretty amazing uh, innovations that, that uh, um, have made a big difference in our business and I hope will help you and yours. I'm going to walk you through some of the decisions we had to make, make in terms of server pitch, serviceability of these servers, power supplies, power distribution schemes, as well as the operational requirements. The other thing that came out of this team were data center designs, both electrical and mechanical designs, that we've now, have, uh, that we've now used in, in two sites uh, under construction. So let's look at some of the decisions we had to make. The first was, what should the server pitch be? Everyone likes 1U servers because they're really nice and dense, um, but one of the side effects of them is you have to use little fans. And when you lose, use little fans, you can't move as much air as you can in the 2U server next to it. The downside, of course, of a 2U server, not very dense, can't fit as many into a rack, blah, blah, blah. What's the ideal solution? So you could say that these curves are showing you essentially sort of the most efficient fans are 2U fans or 60 millimeter fans relative to the power required for a 1U fan. We decided, split the baby. Make a 1.5U server. Take all the benefits of, a, of the 1U's power density, but yet take uh, um, all of the extra, uh, extra room in a 2U server and be able to run larger fans. The net result of this one little decision and this one little change was that our fans used between 2 and 4% of server power rather than 10 to 20% from an off-the-shelf OEM 1U server. Pretty simple decision, but had a pretty big impact on the overall power budget. The next thing we really thought about was just building these servers vanity-free. So this is just a very simple diagram showing you there's a drive cage in the upper left that can hold two drives in the, in the current version of the system. Um, there's a 450-watt power supply that I'm going to go into more detail in a moment. On, uh, and then there's space for both an Intel and an AMD motherboard in the chassis. And then those wonderful fans that don't draw very much power are in the lower left. The next thing we, had to, that, the next thing we looked at, as I talked about, we thought about this problem from all the way from grid to gate, was how would we actually distribute power to these servers? In a conventional data center, there's lots of power transformations, and I've got a, a slide on that in a moment, that, that explains sort of the amount of loss that's created through all of those power transformations. So we came up with this idea of having a building a battery cabinet. It doesn't sound very sexy, but what it was was it was a distributed UPS. It allowed us to take the UPS out of that centralized room that's off in a quarter of a data corner of a data center and distribute power and step down power much closer to the server, thereby reducing the loss. We also thought pretty deeply about server operations. How would these things be accessed? How would they be uh, serviced by data center techs? How would they be deployed into a data center? We built on the, the image on the right shows you a triplet rack, which is nothing other than three racks welded together into a single unit. It's a little fancier than that, but that's fundamentally what it is. 
It just saves time onloading and offloading servers from trucks and boats and, and all of the other ways that we get them to a data center. We ended up doing a time and motion study comparing the serviceability of, of uh, the Facebook server to OEM servers and found there was about a 20, 25% time savings just in servicing these, these devices because there's no screws, no tools required, all just pins and plungers to be able to pull them out of a rack. That's a pretty big difference when you're, you're having to manage uh, thousands of servers at scale. This is the diagram showing you the, the sort of typical data center uh, power conversion system versus how we decided to optimize uh, power delivery for our own data center. And of course, there's lots of different ways of optimizing pay power delivery to a data center. The chart on the right shows you essentially sort of starting at, out at the utility line, coming into the data center, the number of transformations uh, that happen to power. At the end of the day, all of those transformations add up to loss and a considerable amount of power loss. By virtue of, of bringing 480 volts directly to the server, coupled with our battery backup system, which is a, a 48 volt uh, DC battery system, that was the, the, the prior picture, we reduced the loss by almost an order of magnitude. So again, in, improving efficiency and reducing cost to not only to construct, but cost of operations for us. So you may think that this is a pretty fancy system and a pretty fancy, uh, uh, pretty complicated thing, but more than dot-com design started out on napkins. And this is actually uh, the design that came to the lead engineer on the project, a guy named Jay, uh, in the middle of the night, and he grabbed the first thing he had, which was just a din dinner napkin on his nightstand, and laid out what he, how he thought the power distribution scheme would work and how we'd be able to bring 480, 480 volts to the rack, step that down to 277 to deliver to the server, and then combine it with a backup battery system in a very, very efficient manner. And of course, all of these servers have to live somewhere. And so we built a building. I think it look, looks a little bit like the Venetian Hotel, uh, but with different things inside. And we also spent a lot of time optimizing how the building would be built and constructed, again, saving us cost, improving the efficiency of, of the data center. So looking back at this project over the last couple of years, I think we really placed two big bets as it relates to servers and data centers. The first was that we completely rethought and redesigned power delivery and power distribution in the data center. By removing the UPS, it was a huge win in terms of efficiencies and dollars saved. A conventional UPS costs somewhere around $2 a watt. This power distribution scheme costs about 20 cents per watt. Pretty big cost savings. The other thing we did was we took a bet and we removed console access from all of our servers. And the reason we did this was because it was extra cost. We could save a few bucks per server. Again, a few dollars add up over time. And we also figured it was kind of redundant. 14 months, later, 14 months later, after we made that decision, servers started showing up. They started going into production. First phone call from the ops guy. Hey, guys, where's the console? We need console access. What are we going to do here? Small problem. We ended up putting console access back on about 20% of our, our, of our servers here. To me, though, the lesson was move fast, but save room to adapt down the road. Continuing on with that theme of lessons learned, I have a few to share with you. The first is make audacious bets and be willing to work through them really, really quickly. If people tell you it's a bad idea, think about their motivation. It's pretty likely they have a horse in the race against you and they're trying to bet against you. But one of the other side benefits of, of, having, of, of making audacious bets and making several bets in parallel is it's really easy to switch. I talked about it briefly, how we switched from PHP server to, uh, to HPHP and back and forth. When one bet has an advantage for a month or a quarter, that may be enough to allow you to ride through a capacity problem, a product problem, whatever it ends up being. Having all of these things running in parallel is not only a fantastic way to motivate people, it's a Darwinian process, but it allows you to shift depending on uh, what happens to be performing at that point in time. The next lesson from Facebook is small teams win every time. Motivate people to place big bets, it's much easier to do when it's a small team. They tend not to be constrained by convention. And a small number of people working really fast on a problem can just achieve staggering nonlinear gains, as I think both of these examples convey. Third, just make it work. It's as simple as that. Don't wait for the perfect time or the perfect amount of resources. We just tried to make do with what we have. So what? We don't have console ports on a few thousand servers. That's OK. We developed a workaround. We modified the reboot, or excuse me, the, uh, the, the wake on LAN protocol to be reboot on LAN. 
it gives us effectively 90% of the control the servers need and, and quell the ops guy's complaints. The upside is that Intel has now adopted that in, as a spec uh, going forward. The last lesson, manage all of these risks with some kind of hedge, with some kind of protection. We took a lot of risks at Facebook and continue to take big risks, but for every risk, there's a, there's a hedge, there's a protection, either an alternative, parallel, uh, lower risk project, or just something else that we can put in its place. And improving our runtime efficiency was a major feat. Who would have thought that writing a compiler or a source code transformer was the way to do that? It was a big, big bet that could have not paid off and could have just been a complete waste of time. And if it hadn't paid off, as I said, in the end of 2009, we were already out of capacity. We wouldn't have had, we wouldn't have had anywhere to go, except we had a couple of sort of relief valves that we could open, and maybe we would have to change the way the site worked as an alternative. Just, just as with Open Compute, we worked with many different suppliers, and we generally had two suppliers for each key piece of, uh, of, of infrastructure, for each, for each key component. And we were able to monitor their progress all the way, all the way through. Ultimately, not all of those suppliers made it to the end, uh, to the end with us, and this, was, this is Darwin again at work. In building Facebook, we were able to leverage a lot of open source software to scale, and really scale very rapidly. And thankfully, we've contributed a lot of these innovations back to the community. I think something like 20 uh, projects have been started at Facebook, and we've contributed to lots of others, as many of you have in this room. And when we decided to build our own servers and data centers, we always had this vision of opening up the technology to the community as well. And as such, open compute is a continuation of this engineering philosophy, building platforms by first building components, and then coupling those components together into applications. Having those components as primitives allows us to not only have those primitives or components have value, but allows us to reconfigure as needed, kind of like a Lego system. But we also took this approach because we knew we would never hire all of the smartest and all of the best people in the industry. And we wanted to be able to leverage the smartest people and get other people involved in helping us make open compute or hip hop or any one of the other key pieces of infrastructure even better. And even if you can't take advantage of open compute, perhaps your cloud provider can. A cl by virtue of cloud provider adopting open compute, they could provide a more economical service or a more efficient service, and they can also collaborate on an infrastructure design, making that, uh, making that component better for them. The main message I really want to emphasize as I wrap up is that we can all be much more effective by leveraging the larger community around us, releasing components that can be set free and leaving people to build and imagine what they can do with them. This is something people do on Facebook every day. With that in mind, I want to close by sharing a video with you. It illustrates in a very different way how a person leveraged Facebook to solve a very difficult problem. It's also a personal reminder to me that everything all of us do ultimately ends up in the hands of users who then use those technologies in some very delightful and unexpected ways. Thank you. On April 27, 2011, storms ripped through the south. Our state was hit very hard, the state of Alabama. There was over 200 tornadoes in a 24-hour span, and it spared my family, it spared my, my house, my belongings, but my neighbors just to the south were not so lucky. raining pictures, raining pieces of books, and big pieces of metal fell from the sky. I found mail in our yard from Smithville, Mississippi. We are in Leicester, Alabama, and that is between 150 to 200 miles away. There was a piece of white paper laying on the side of the road out here. I went and picked it up, and it was an ultrasound picture, and it just broke my heart. And I can show you the picture. I was just sitting there thinking, this mother doesn't have this. And I know it's, it's really messed up, but if that's all they had left, I'm sure that they, that they would want this back. I felt like I'm picking up pieces of these people's lives. This is somebody that I'm picking up. 
This had to come from a house that's been damaged. I hope these people are okay. One of the very first things that popped into my mind was I need to find the owners. So I thought, well, I'll create a Facebook page. And my intentions that night was if I could just get 100 people on there and, you know, return maybe one picture, it would be worth my time. I started the page about 7.30. By midnight, it had a 1,000 hits on it. And the number of responses of other people that had found the same things and are wanting to help but didn't know what to do with them, it has been overwhelming. It's like looking at a photo album of people affected by these tornadoes. Are memories that you can't get back. You can rebuild your home, you can buy another car, but these are moments in time. To someone that's lost everything, it can mean the world. Thank you.